Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Computer Hardware Part 1 and Overview. In this video, we're going to take a look at the basics of computer hardware. I think a natural place we should start off with is making sure we're all on board on exactly what the computer hardware is. So we have this distinction in computing between the hardware, which is the physical device, and the software. And I think everybody understands at some instinctual level that the software are these programs that we add to the computer. And so say, for example, I find out that I need to record all of the lectures for this quarter, I might decide, oh, I heard Premiere Pro is a really great video editing program. I should go ahead and get a copy of that. And so I can go ahead and purchase it and install it on my computer. So that I think we all understand that. But actually, there's a lot that's integral to our computer, or we think is integral to our computer that actually isn't part of the computer hardware. So I can buy a MacBook Pro from the store, and I naturally think that the fact that it's a Macintosh is naturally part of the computer, but it actually turns out I can take that MacBook Pro computer and I can actually replace the system software with Windows. So suppose I start working in a lab and it turns out that that lab requires me to use some software and I can't run it on my Macintosh because it doesn't run on Mac OS, I can actually replace Mac OS with Microsoft Windows on my MacBook Pro hardware. And that's because the operating system is actually software as well. So those are the instructions that we think of as being an integral part of the computer and they're actually not. They're just instructions running on the hardware. Similarly, if I decided I wanted to take my laptop here and turn it into uh, some sort of a server and I wanted to get um, Linux software for it, I can go ahead and replace Mac OS with Linux. And again, that's because the system software is replaceable and that is something, a set of instructions that runs on top of the hardware. So we have this distinction between software and hardware, and we have a distinction between application software and system software. And we're gonna take a close look at the system software and the operating system uh, in another lecture. All right, let's uh, let's focus on the hardware itself. We distinguish between three main categories of hardware. We have processing, which is primarily the central processing unit. And then we have memory, which consists of two types of me memory. There's primary memory and secondary memory, where primary memory is colloquially thought of as RAM, although it turns out there's a little bit more to it than just the RAM. And the secondary memory are things like the solid state drive, the hard drive, flash memory. And basically the distinction between the primary memory and the secondary memory is the primary memory is what we refer to as volatile. So if the power goes out, I lose all the information in the primary memory. The secondary memory is non-volatile, which means even if I completely lose power, the information in secondary memory is still fine. Um, the other main distinction is Primary memory is much, much faster than secondary memory because you may wonder, why don't we just use this non-volatile memory? Well, the answer is because it's much slower. Now, I also should highlight here that nowadays this distinction between primary and secondary memory, or more pointedly, volatile versus non-volatile memory, is a little bit hidden because we're used to being able to put our laptops or cell phones or our tablets to sleep and turn them on later and everything's still there exactly as it was before. And it turns out that when we put a computer to sleep, the main memory is still getting a little bit of trickle charge of electricity. If the battery goes out completely, you're gonna lose all the information. So in addition to processing and memory, there's also input output. And that includes things like the obvious, the display, the keyboard, the mouse if you've got one, and it also includes external devices like printers and scanners. I should also mention that while I'm primarily gonna be focusing here on laptops and desktops, smartphones and tablets work almost exactly the same. They have the exact same distinction between primary memory and secondary memory. They've got that processor with a central processing unit and modern smartphones and tablets also have a graphics processing unit. And then finally, there's something in terms of input output. Uh, I suppose in some sense that the display is acting as both an output and an input uh, for smartphones and tablets. But in addition to these types of computers, there's also what are referred to as embedded computers or embedded systems. And embedded computers are the computers that, that run inside of things like our, our car. So you know, our car has computers that are tracking different pieces of input, like how hot is the engine, 
you know, how much fuel do I have? How hard is the user pressing on the gas pedal? These are the sorts of inputs that come into the embedded computer that's inside of your car. And the outputs would be things like, you know, how much flow of gasoline should I let into the engine? So there's lots and lots of different computers other than just the desktops, the laptops, the smartphones, and, and our tablets. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is we've gone over processing with a central processing unit and a graphics processing unit. We've gone over our memory with the primary and secondary memory. And what I want to do now is see how these different components kind of play out when I'm carrying out some basic computing tasks. So let's start off with, I'm going to install an application. So I mentioned before, hey, I need to get a hold of Premiere Pro. So what is, what is that all going to involve? Well, Premiere Pro consists of a bunch of different instructions. And so I need to get a hold of those instructions and get them onto my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and download a copy of those instructions and I'm going to install it on my computer. Now, it turns out a lot of times when I'm installing these programs, um, the programs that I'm actually getting over the internet, or sometimes when I'm buying a CD-ROM or a DVD uh, copy of a program, it's actually, those programs are actually compressed. So we talked about compression last week, um, particularly if you're installing over the internet, but again, also sometimes when you're installing from a DVD or CD, uh, the files are compressed in order to allow it to transfer through the internet, uh, you know, taking less space, which makes things cheaper for whoever's paying to uh, serve up those files. So when they come over to your computer, they do need to be decompressed. Sometimes there's a two-step process that like actually decompresses all the files onto your hard drive. And then after they've been decompressed, you have to run an additional installation program. So that's what's going on with that. Um, so. I need to get the files, I need to get the installation files onto my computer and I need to decompress them and get the instructions onto my computer. Those instructions, since they're things that I want to have stick around, even when the power on my computer goes off, therefore those instructions need to go on my secondary memory device, whether it's a solid state drive or a hard disk, ultimately the instructions after I'm done installing are going to be on that secondary memory device. Now, when I run an application, what happens is the instructions need to be copied into main memory because it turns out the central processing unit cannot access things directly on the hard disk or the solid state drive. So if my program is actually going to execute as opposed to the program is just installed on my computer and I'm not actually running it, if it's installed on my computer and I'm not actually running it, then the instructions are on the hard disk or the SSD. When I actually double click on that, or I tap on it on my cell phone and it starts up, the instructions are gonna get copied from the solid state drive or the hard disk. They're gonna get copied into main memory where they can actually get access by the CPU. Now, as far as documents go, like let's say um, I'm, I decided I wanted to open up a Microsoft Word document. Those documents, when I'm not accessing them directly from a program, they're going to also sit in that secondary memory device because I want to keep my um, introduction to humanities paper. I want to keep that around after the computer turns off. If the computer turns off and loses power, I still want to have my IAM paper. So uh, that needs to be on this, the secondary memory device. Now, when I actually start editing that paper, again, the CPU cannot access things directly from the secondary memory device. So the all the, the contents of my paper need to get copied into main memory. So when I'm interacting with it, when I'm manipulating it, it's in main memory. When I go ahead and save it, it copies everything from main memory. It copies it into secondary storage. So we do need to understand this distinction between the main memory and the secondary storage. Now, one question that comes up is, how do I know, you know, my computer's not acting as quickly as I'd like what, what what should I do about it? Do I need more main memory or do I need more secondary storage? Well, in general, you're going to need more secondary storage if you're storing a lot of data. So let's say, for example, um, you decide you want to be a vlogger. So you're going to you're going to do I guess they're called vloggers. You want, let's just say you decide you want to become a vlogger. You're going to have a whole bunch of video. That video is going to take a lot a lot of space. Now it's not like you're going to have all that video playing at the same time. If you're playing all that video at the same time, then it all needs to be in main memory, but you're not playing it all at the same time. 
you you create and edit one of them. You, of course, you don't want to lose it, so you need to store it. You create and edit another one. And so if you have lots of video files, you need more secondary storage, whether it's you're going to need a bigger SSD or you've got so much stuff that turns out it's cheaper to buy storage and hard disk. So you go ahead and buy a hard disk and store it in your hard disk. On the other hand, if you're running lots and lots of programs at once, and I see lots and lots of students that do this, if you're running a whole bunch of programs at once, then you need to get more main memory. So, you know, if you can double your main memory, you're going to find that your programs are running a lot more efficiently because um, basically there's a limit to how many programs can be at main memory at once. And there's a system called virtual memory, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where, uh, you know, if you've got too many programs to fit into main memory, it can the computer can still kind of go, but it's going using virtual memory, and that's going to really slow things down. And a lot of students run way too many programs for the amount of main memory they have, and it really hurts their performance.